Hello, uh, welcome to the workshop. So today I'd like to talk to you about this, which is the Easy Egypt Archaeologist Assistant. It's what I made for the Exploration and Discovery exhibit at uh, Steampunks in Space 2022. I had originally planned to actually shoot this talking about it at Steampunks in Space, but best laid plans and all that, I got chatting to people, it was busy, uh, there was a lot of stuff I'd much rather be doing there than shooting video, so it didn't happen, but we're doing it here instead. So basically just want to talk to you about some of the techniques I used, how I built the different elements of it, and sort of a little bit about building something for exhibition rather than something to actually be wearable or, or sort of particularly usable. So, we'll start off, I'm going to read out to you this, which is the quick start guide that I made, which just says, The Easy Egypt Archaeologist's Assistant. Thank you for your purchase of the Easy Egypt Archaeologist's Assistant. The Easy Egypt Archaeologist Assistant can, in many ways, render the archaeologist's team of expert assistants redundant. This device has been designed following many years of exhaustive research in Egypt and the Orient and is endorsed by the British Empire's leading Egyptological experts. The device can assist the modern archaeologist in three principal ways. Detection and location of burial chambers and tombs, rapid initial valuation of recovered artefacts, detection of the presence of curses on sarcophagi and other artefacts, hand unit, that's this, key features, the hand unit contains the mode and sensitivity knobs and a multi-range meter. This unit utilizes the very latest in high frequency thermionic valve technology to allow a compact construction and ensure an easy hand to handle weight of just six pounds. The hand unit is supplied with two heads, a non-contact sweep head, best for scanning the ground to locate tombs and scanning irregularly shaped or delicate artifacts, that's the one I've got on it at the moment. The contact or surface head, best for scanning tomb walls, manuscripts and other artefacts with large relatively flat surfaces. That's the one that's on the backpack here. Both heads can be used in any of the archaeologist assistant's three operating modes, though for the most accurate valuations it is recommended that the surface head be used. Backpack key features. So this is the backpack. The easy to carry backpack contains the main batteries that power the unit and weighs in at a featherweight 30 pounds excluding batteries and is supplied with a useful ammeter and voltmeter to monitor the remaining battery charge. Features stowage for both hand units and for an excavation tool of your choice, in brackets a range of excavation tools are available to purchase separately. The battery should be charged nightly when the unit is in use and disconnected if the unit is to be stored for any length of time. The Easy Egypt company recommends the installation of four EverReady Type 32F dry cell batteries for the best results with the archaeologist's assistant. It is recommended you familiarise yourself with the user manual prior to using the assistant. Now, obviously, this is fictional. I completely wrote this. It is kind of... I see this as a little bit of a commentary as to what was going on in sort of the 1920s, which is obviously what this device is supposed to be. It's supposed to be Art Deco 1920s. Seeing this as a little bit of a commentary as to what was going on with sort of essentially the plundering of Egypt at that time. Um, so yeah, it is supposed to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek, this. Um, the user manual here is... that is just blank. It is, it is purely just um, for the, the effect of looking at the front of it. So both of these were aged in the same way, which is using um, artists' pastels and then uh, spraying them over with hairspray to fix them. So it's just rubbed in artist pastels to give the sort of aged paper and dusty, dirty look. The uh, silver text on this was done with a rubber stamp and embossing powder. And then that one, the uh, the agent stamp just there, if you can see that is um, that is a genuine stamp. I'm not quite sure how old it is, but it came in a job lot that I bought a while ago. The only other paper thing that's on here is this, which is 
just my little card. So we'll start by just talking about the there's only one part of this unit that's actually genuinely from this era and that's these headphones which are a standard set of um, crystal radio operators headphones so these are these were bought second hand from a vintage fair but they are the only part of this that is genuinely of that era the rest of it is entirely constructed by me using whatever materials I had available. So we'll start with this hand unit here. So this is not the easiest to think. This is when I say about making something for exhibition. This, you can't actually hold this and use it because the it is ridiculously front heavy. You'd really struggle to hold this out in your hand for any anything other than a very short length of time. It, uh, as I say, is purely an exhibition piece, this. So that is the end here. I might just get up and move around. So at the end here, we've got a, it was described as an aircraft heating coil. I bought it from Burkitt's in Lincoln. Not 100% sure what it is or what it's for, but it's kind of got that look of a bit like a metal detector. This, all of this, and this bit on here, and this little gooseneck is all parts of a floor standing reading lamp that uh, my next door neighbours were throwing out. So I dismantled it and used a lot of the uh, brushed steel tubing for making this. Um, this just here is a um, resistance coil like you typically use as sort of a voltage divider for something. So it's a variable sort of variac type resistor that I again came from Burkitt's in Lincoln. Um, these meters aren't genuine. These meters are resin casts and they're produced using a silicon mold like this. So this is a silicon mold taking off a genuine Art Deco meter that I have. And what I do is I get some black resin and I pour up to the line where the glass is, where the glass would be. I then put in, I then create a meter digitally on Photoshop. So generally I find a photo of a meter online and then edit it, though the two in here are actually scans of the two original meters that I've got. Print it, laminate it, put it into here, then fill the rest of the mold with resin and you end up with a solid black resin meter. The advantage of these are they're a lot lighter than the genuine meters and they don't need drilling. So this is purely just surface mounted. And the dials are pretty convincing until you get very, very close to them. The knobs on here also resin casts, taken in this mold, which is a mold of loads of different um, control knobs from different things. So this one on here is actually off a 1920s um, electric blanket controller. So these are the correct sort of knobs for the era. And then obviously all the text on here is transfers done uh, printing onto um, decal paper just using a, uh, an inkjet printer. The box here is constructed from Fomex and Plasticard. So, so that's all plastic and then that's just a draw handle. And then if I just flip this thing round, you see that the fancy bracket on the back is the bracket off a security light that was, was on the back of my house until it died. But it's got kind of the right look. So I used that bracket, but the rest of this, that's Fomex, the sides of Plasticard. The box itself is actually very lightweight. It's the head that's what I say, it's very front heavy. You really would struggle to carry this ready, certainly out for any length of time. Obviously the weights on here aren't real, but they are a little bit, again, a little bit tongue in cheek because obviously a six pound hand unit is ridiculously heavy, but is described as lightweight because everything in that era used heavyweight technology. This cable that runs to the, connects the hand unit to the backpack is um, cable wrap. So it's plastic cable wrap, sort of braided cable wrap like you'd use for um, organising the cables inside a gaming PC. So quite a cheap product, you can buy it on eBay. 
It uh, looks quite effective as almost a metalised sort of braided cable and obviously I've soaked this in dilute acrylic paint to give it uh, some age so it looks a little bit sort of dirty and rusty because the whole point with this was it was supposed to look used because I want this, the idea with this was it looked, it was to look like a genuine piece that had been used in the 1920s in Egypt and had then been returned and was on display in a museum. So we'll now look at the other head for the hand unit, which is this one. So the, ah, I did lie, tell a lie when I said that, was the, that was the only genuine piece on it. That is a 1920s um, porcelain ceiling rose for a light fitting. So again, we've got a piece of angle poise lamp, and then this is what a little uh, tabletop cleaning brush that I got from a charity shop. So it's designed for like um, sweeping crumbs off a dining table, but uh, you can see how that could be run across, say, the surface of a document to scan it. It was just sort of, it had the right sort of look and it was the right colour, the right sort of chrome sort of colour. Though I think technically this is actually silver plate that's been then lacquered over. Then we've got the uh, excavation tool, which is a cut down child spade from Aldi. So I wasn't sure if I was actually going to include an excavation tool on this until I went to Aldi. They had these little children's gardening tools, so they had a little rake and a little spade. So I found this little spade, the handle was about twice this length, so I cut the handle down. Again, wood is aged with uh, dilute acrylic paint to just make it look old. The colour on all of this that a um, friend of mine, um, who you'll probably know as Hair Doctor, he uh, describes this as uh, government issue green. The colour is actually, um, it's a Halfords car colour, it's Ford Highland Green, which is a very, very close match to government issue green or sort of aircraft interior green. So I do like that colour for doing stuff like this, where it's supposed to be of a certain era, anywhere between sort of the 1920s up to sort of about the 1970s. This colour works very well for control panels and that kind of thing. Um, and it's quite a nice colour, to be honest, for stuff like this. Then a lot of the weathering on this, and I will talk about that a bit more when I get to the backpack, is airbrushed on. So the backpack, now this is actually, was actually the easiest part of it to build because this is a two compartment bread bin from um, TK Maxx. Now I didn't buy it from TK Maxx, I found it in a charity shop, but I've since found that this is from TK Maxx. It had a drawer in the front here and then a handle on here to lift the top up. The top doesn't have it, the inside doesn't have any detail in, but obviously I'm seeing the top as the battery compartment and then the electronics being in the bottom. So again, we have two of these um, resin cast uh, meters. This time I've used the actual backs for, for the two that I, I, I have. Um, genuine binding posts, again, from Burkitt's. And I think the switch and the light were possibly from Burkitt's as well. I'm not entirely sure on the light. That might have come off an eBay job lot. And then uh, the backing here, obviously, I wanted to continue that same shape from the hand unit through into the back. So that's a piece of Fomex. Um, small terry clips on the side to hold the tools. Very much how a lot of these kind of things were made back then. And the airbrush weather, so the airbrush weathering, what I did with this, the paint on this, was I sanded it all down because it was sort of enameled to begin with. So I sanded that to roughen the surface, key the paint, sprayed it with um, grey Alfred's car primer over the top of that. I did do some pre-shading with the airbrush on that, but none of it actually came through when I put the green on top. So... There's not really much of it, much benefit to talking about that. Um, so I did that, painted it with the, I think it was two or possibly three coats of the Ford Highland Green. Then I took a sort of rusty brown, very dilute colour 
Actually, no, I didn't. The next thing I did was I sponged on the silver on any areas. So that's just silver metallic paint on any edges and any areas that I thought would get bumped or get wear in use. So all the high spots essentially got a sponged on silver uh, acrylic paint, undiluted, just the thick as it comes out the tube. Not expensive paint, I just bought it from the works. So I think it was about, possibly about two pounds for a tube of it, of this silver. Sponged it on. Then the next thing was a, a wash of very, very dilute brown, sort of rusty brown acrylic. So that was very, very dilute. In fact, I can probably grab that now. So you can see just how dilute it actually is. That's the uh, brown that I used. Um, so airbrushing that on and again focusing on the area the high spots but it did get a general sort of streaking over it to just sort of show that this had been out it had got rained on it had got been in a sandstorm and what have you and it had just got very dirty and very aged then i lacquered it with a how again halford's acrylic car lacquer two coats of that then transfers, just water slide decals printed on, on an inkjet printer. The key with that is obviously once you print it on an inkjet printer, you then have to lacquer over them before you put them in water because inkjet ink is water soluble, so you have to seal them first. Transfers onto here, you don't have to do that if you've got a laser printer, which would be an advantage if I had one. Transfers on, then lacquer over the transfers to fix them in place. And I didn't actually put, I, I was wondering whether to put any dull coat on this, so any um, like artist matte medium, but in the end decided it didn't really need it, although it had been lacquered, it's not massively shiny, it's more a satin sort of finish, which uh, for something like this works quite well. Then obviously after it was all painted and all painted hardened, I added the final things like putting the switches in, the buttons, the, the gauges, the connectors for the hand unit. So the hand unit here is on a block of wood, but this here, this little thing is a, it's a connector that would have been used sort of inside something like a radiogram. I've got a few of them. I, I do buy every so often job lots of um, old sort of electrical components off eBay. Um, what, where they tend to actually come up bizarrely is um, they tend to get job lot to does model railway stuff I think because people buy bought these things back in the day to use as model rail for model railway electrics but uh, they tend to end up getting job lotted on eBay as model railway stuff and that seems to be the easiest way to find um, old electrical components sort of like like these sort of switches and and uh, connectors like this, as I say, unless you've got access to a shop like Burkitt's in Lincoln. And then the straps on this are just two leather belts from Primark. That's as simple as it gets. They are just uh, bolted through into the backpack. So what makes this an exhibition piece is that this backpack is not particularly wearable. It's not very comfortable to wear at all. It hangs in the wrong place on your back because I did the straps how they looked best for sitting on an exhibition, not as how they'd, look, they'd work for actually wearing it. The hand unit is too front heavy and you couldn't carry it for any length of time. And probably if you actually walk around with these, the tools would fall off the sides after a while. So this is very much an exhibition piece. It's not designed to be wearable at all but um, just thought people might be interested in how I built this because I didn't do a build log of this because it was, time was very much of the essence to get this finished. So thank you very much for watching. If you do like this content, please take the time to like and subscribe. Click the bell icon so you get notified when I put new videos out. I am trying to create more content, especially over the winter when... Um, Make, when there aren't so many events and uh, the workshop gets a bit cold during the winter for actually making stuff. But um, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, hope to see you soon.